So I first want to start by thanking the directors of each ministry, all the volunteers that are working very hard through each of our three services. It takes a lot of work to make this church run smoothly, and I, I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your talents and your treasure and just always coming together to make this church work. So thank you so much for that. And as we go into this next season, it is a lot. So I'm thankful and I'm grateful for you. We are going to continue right along in our churchwide campaign called All In. And what we're doing with our time together is looking at what it means to be all in for Jesus. All in for God. Two weeks ago, we started looking at things that keep us from God, from going all in for Jesus. We talked about how fear can stop us in our tracks, can just completely make us not want to continue forward in our faith. Last week, we talked about guilt and how in the church setting, we see a lot of people with this guilt, these feelings of unworthiness, these feelings of not being able to be forgiven even by God. And we looked at what it means to confront that guilt and how to drop the weight of guilt. Today we're talking about something a little more somber. We're going to be talking about grief, suffering, pain, sorrows, and tears. And when you are filled with any of those that potentially can stop you from going all in with Christ. In fact, it might actually push you away and make you walk away. Suffering and grief can sometimes make you go out instead of all in. So today we're going to look at how to have faith and be all in, even if you are filled with sorrow and grief and pain and tears. Let me start with this. Let me ask you, how many people in here are criers? Anybody in here a crier? I saw a few more guys raise their hand this morning at this service. Thank you, fellas, because you're being truthful. A lot of times, ladies have a much easier time raising their hand saying, yeah, I'm a crier, but I'm telling you, if I were to put on Field of Dreams, when their dad and son start playing catch together, I know you guys might start crying a little bit. I know it. You'll be sucking back some tears. I know. Even Toy Story 3. Anybody watch Toy Story 3 and Andy just leaves his toys? Oh, why? Why? Being a crier is not a bad thing. It's not. You, you feel things. One of my kids, I'm not going to call him out today, but one of my boys, my wife and I, we call him a sensi. What that means is sensitive. He's a little bit more sensitive. He, he feels more. So we call him our little sensi. So what gets you going? What makes you cry? Now I will say I get more choked up now than I ever have in the past as I've gotten older over the past 10 years. I don't express myself through tears as much as I would actually like, but there are a few things that get me going. Dogs dying in movies every time. Every time I can watch a war movie where limbs are being torn off, people are being blown up, but if you, that little puppy comes in there and that puppy dies, tears are going to start rolling. I'm telling you right now. Another thing that gets me going is having a fever. Every person in here, any lady in here is like, of course you can't handle being sick. Of course. I don't know. It's just a response I get. If I have a 98.9 degree fever, I might start crying. And I know there's nurses in here right now. That's not a fever. Listen, I don't feel well. That's all I know. I can start tearing up sometimes when it's feelings of nostalgia, when I can look back at pictures of seeing how fast my boys are growing up, and that can get me. And now, being a Christian, I can feel pain for this world. I can tear up for my brothers and sisters who are struggling when I see suffering and toil and pain and sadness, I feel it a lot more than I ever did. And the Bible is filled with this type of sorrow and these type of tears. Last week, we started looking at the Psalms, and Psalms are known for their raw and emotional depth. They express a wide range of feelings from joy to deep sorrow. 
This isn't going to be on your screen or in your notes, but Psalm 6, it says this, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. That's a rough night right there. This person is going through it. Psalm 42 says, my tears have been my food day and night. Psalm 56, 8 says, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? That's a lot of drama. That's a lot of tears going on. Faith brings some emotions into your life that you might have never expected. Today, the question for us is this. How do we handle our times of weeping? How do we handle our times of pain and sorrow and grief and despair? How does faith, how does being all in with God help us with this? So we're going to read this short little psalm that I like to go back to in my life quite often because I believe it's just this perfect picture overview of that emotional life that brings forth everything from it. Let's check this out. Psalm 126. It reads, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now the background to this psalm is debated. We don't really have the big historical context to this. It doesn't really specify or indicate any sort of specific crisis. That's okay. Because it makes it applicable to a wide range of similar situations, even perhaps in our lives. The point is, I chose this psalm because I want you to see how God's family, how the Jews dealt with their tears. To look and understand how they dealt with their times of weeping and sorrow. Especially from the great verses. I mean, verse 6, he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. And then Psalm 5, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Here's the question this psalm raises that we're going to try to address today. How do we sow tears today to reap shouts of joy tomorrow? And this is going to kind of sound strange to you, a strange question, but let me ask you, what do you do with your tears? What do you do with them? What am I doing with my tears? I wipe them on my sleeve, right? I wipe them on my shirt. I wipe them on a napkin. What are you talking about? Well, according to God's word, they need to be sown. Your tears need to be invested. Your tears need to be planted. Now, I can't wait for someone to go home today. Something happens to them and they start crying and they're going to run out to their garden. They're going to run out to their lawn and start dripping those tears Hey, God's word told me I need to sow my tears. I'm sowing away. Now, I know this might sound strange, but are you wasting your tears? Are you wasting your sorrows? Are you investing them? Are you using them? How are you crying? Because you're going to cry. In this world, you will weep. But how are you weeping? That's the question. So the first thing we're going to pull from this psalm, from this scripture is this. The life of faith encompasses both joy and weeping. Both of them together. Now the psalm tells us that these people had experienced a tremendous act of the deliverance of God. Again, we don't know the historical context. Some commentaries will tell you the psalmist was speaking of the the Israelites returning from exile. You can see from verse 1, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. There is this overwhelming joy and perhaps even disbelief felt by the people for what God had done in their lives. This imagery of like those who dream suggests that their restoration felt almost too good to be true. 
highlighting this miracle, this miraculous nature. Yet, as great as it is, they're in trouble again. Verses 1 and 3 is remembering something. Verses 4 through 6 is experiencing the present. Verse 1 through 3, something in the past. Verse 4, they say again, restore our fortunes. So what can we learn from this? No matter how much God does for you in this life, it won't get rid of every sorrow in your life on this planet. It's not going to. No matter how much he has done for you, there is still unbroken joy on this side of heaven. No matter how much you have laughed in this world, you will weep. And maybe right now you're thinking, this is a downer, man. What are we talking about here? My Christianity is all rejoicing. My Christianity is all hallelujah. My Christianity is all laughing. My Christianity is health and wealth, baby. That's not life on this earth. And that's okay. That is absolutely okay because God shows us a way to deal with this. Verses 1 through 3 are all about joy. 4 through 6, all about sorrow. In a sense, it's telling you if you are a believer, you're going to have, like everybody else, joy and sorrow. You're going to have this even-handed life. Yet, this is what we do know from verse 6. In the end... Joy has the final word. Joy has the final word. In other words, if you want to see an emotional map of your life, this map is going to show us as a believer there is equal weeping and rejoicing, valleys and hilltops, ups and downs and twists and turns. But even through weeping, in the end, joy has the final word in your life. And too often people stop following this map right in the valley. As soon as they get in the valley, as soon as they get into some trouble, they drop the map and they try to venture out on their own and they get lost. As soon as pain comes, as soon as sorrow comes, as soon as the tears start to start to rain down upon their face, they leave. They are not all in. This is a mistake. When you are a Jesus follower, even through the weeping, in the end, joy has the final word in your life, all of your lives. The big picture here is there will be a note of joy that can never be put out, kind of like a pilot flame. Even when the burner is off, you look down there, it's still burning. And when the gas shows up, this flame just takes off again. Look into your heart, look into your soul, look into your mind. You are a Christian. Even in times of weeping, there is a pilot light of joy in your life. And in the end, joy always has the final note. It is important to know that the life of faith is both of rejoicing and weeping. Why? Because we follow one who is both a rejoicer and a weeper. We follow one who is a mourner and and a singer. Check this out. We talked about, I think, just two months ago or a month ago, how we follow one who began his ministry, his first miraculous sign to tell us who he was, was to make a wedding better, to be the party bringer. Jesus first comes out, his very first sign he's going to show us what he's all about. What does he do? He doesn't raise the dead. He doesn't walk on water. He doesn't heal the sick. He makes a wedding, the party. You see this. He shows us that he is the master of ceremonies. He is the Lord of hosts. He has come to bring festive joy to all of us. And yet, in Jesus' life, you often get words like weeping and groaning and sighing and move with pity. There is so much in the New Testament that describes Jesus' emotional life like that. Here's one who's a great exalter. He's the one who throws a party and shows you what he's really about. But he's also the one, he's a man of sorrows. In this own mixture of great joy and tremendous sorrow. It tells us in Hebrews 12, why did Jesus go through this sorrow? For the sake of the joy that was set before him, he went 
to the cross. There's this same mixture again. And what's kind of twisted and kind of confusing, since becoming a Christian, I've experienced greater joy than I ever have, but I've also experienced greater sorrow than I ever have. As a Christian, I'm sure you have felt the same way. Why? Why, why, why might we feel sadness deeper than ever before? Well, joy produces tears. Joy produces tears. I'm going to explain to you right now. You might be saying, wait a minute, wait a second. What do you mean by saying the gospel and faith actually makes you sadder? Now, let me explain. 20 years ago, 2004, The Passion of the Christ came out to all theaters. Does anybody remember this movie? Did anybody go see this movie? Okay. Now, one thing I kept hearing about this movie was all the crying. I wasn't a Christian 20 years ago in 2004. I heard people tell me, I cried all the time. The whole movie, I was in tears. I heard people say, make sure you bring your your tissues. You're going to cry. And I remember thinking, why? Why are you crying? Come on, this is not Old Yeller. No dog's dying. I don't understand. I don't get it. Cry over what? What are you crying over? Spoiler alert, I know how the story ends. I might not be a Christian, but he comes back, right? He comes back. He doesn't stay dead. Why are we crying? What's wrong with all these Christians? Then Nicole and I went and saw the movie, not a Christian, and it made me sad. It made me sad. I understood something after seeing that movie. Yes, I knew how it ended, but to see someone sacrifice so much for the people that he's trying to save, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I kept thinking, these people are dumb. He's just trying to help you. He hasn't even done anything wrong, according to this movie. He's done nothing wrong. All he wants to do is help you. He's even willing to die for you. And I saw this, the images. He went through a lot just for you. Little did I know that was part of the foundation of my faith. And I would be preaching that every Sunday for years to come. We are all dumb. He's just trying to help us. He's just trying to save us. You see, the sentiment has not changed within me. It hasn't. So why do we feel more when being a Jesus follower? I can tell you right now, it's our hearts. Last week, we talked about creating in us a new heart. Cleanse us, Lord. Clean our hearts. Well, it doesn't just talk about this theme in Psalm 51. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's an extremely inter- interesting theme throughout. Ezekiel eleven nineteen says this, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. He says this in Ezekiel 36 also. Paul talks about this. 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. See, the spirit comes in. It writes the law of God, not on stone, but of tablets of your heart. It takes away your heart of stone and turns it into a heart of flesh. What does that mean? It means salvation will make your heart more a heart. More a heart. It will not just make you feel joy. It makes you feel joy more deeply. It melts your heart from stone. It makes you more sensitive. It makes your heart more a heart, not a heart of stone. The Bible tells us Jesus wept. Famous line. Shortest line in scripture. Most people know it. Jesus wept. Memorize a line. Got it. Jesus wept. Why? Because he was perfect. He was more loving than us. He was more compassionate than us. He was more sensitive to God's heart than us. He had higher aspirations for people than us. And the more sensitive to God's heart you get, 
you are going to weep. You're going to cry. It's only natural. Don't you see that? For example, before becoming a Christian, maybe you had some moral standards. I'm speaking for myself right now. The difference in me, if I blew it, if I broke a law, if I told a lie, I did something like that, I'd kick myself and be mad at myself and just get over it. After becoming a Christian, if you understand the gospel, now when you lie, you haven't just broken a rule, you've broken a heart. You're going to weep. You're not just going to kick yourself. You've made dirty a heart. This is why we pray for cleansing of our hearts, Lord. Another thing that happens when you go all in to this Christian life, you're going to see that ministry is messy. This is why I said thank you to all the directors of their ministries and the volunteers. Ministry is messy. You get to see all too well the needs and the troubles of others. And it can really direct you into a state of negativity. We have to break that negativity. Your heart will hurt with their heart. Their pain becomes your pain because of the compassion that's flowing out of your heart now. You hear all the time at churches, they use this phrase, doing life together. Okay? And I know now it's overused and it's become kind of this cliche. I see memes about it all the time. Doing life together. The truth is, overused or not, this is what the church is supposed to do. Do life together. To laugh together. To cry together. To rejoice together. To do ministry together. And you're going to feel it all deeply. Ministry is messy, but it is so worth doing it together. To come as a family of believers and love on each other, support each other, encourage each other. It's worth doing. So how does gospel joy produce sorrow and tears? It's the joy of knowing Christ. It's the joy of asking for this, this clean heart every day. This joy exposes the things in this world. It exposes stuff within yourself, and that leads to this sadness. But here's good news. I don't want to leave you on that. The good news is tears produce joy. These tears are going to produce joy. Now, there is this worship band out of Sacramento, California called Jesus Culture. This is how important worship music is. Good worship songs should either be pulling right from Scripture take it right out of there, or be inspired right from God's word. When I was worship leading, there was this popular song by Jesus Culture called Your Love Never Fails. The lyrics read, there may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And you sing that over and over and over again in the chorus. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. I would have people request that song over and over and over and over again, almost to annoyance. Sing that one again. Sing that one again. One weekend, you wouldn't sing that song. You know what song you should sing? That one about the pain and the night and the tears and all that stuff. I know. But I get it. It resonates with all of us, believers or not. This fact of pain in the night and joy in the morning. What is this? Christian thought. So Psalm 35 has this very famous phrase. It says, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. If you're a believer, what this is saying is sorrow gives way to joy. You may have sorrow, but if you believe in him, if you believe in Jesus, in the end, you will have joy. Sorrow is temporary. Joy is permanent. Sorrow gives way to joy. But check this out. The New Testament goes beyond the Old Testament. Because the New Testament does not just say for a believer that sorrow gives way to joy. The New Testament goes so far as to say the most odd and radical thing. That sorrow actually produces joy. It produces it. 
Paul says the 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. It doesn't just say sorrows will give way to joy. Now it's saying sorrows are producing joy. They're creating joy. They're achieving joy. How amazing is this? I mean, how can this be? Now, my, my favorite theologian says, and very famous, says, the way this is, is when you look to Jesus, when you look right to the Savior. He was a man of incredible sorrows. He was in pain. He was rejected. He was tortured. He was killed. He sorrowed like no one had ever sorrowed before or ever will sorrow. But his sorrows didn't just give way to joy. His sorrows produced joy, produced this new joy, produced this new glory. His sorrows were the redeeming way that opened the door for this joy and this glory. And if that is true, then there must be in some way this pattern that remains in each of us today who are believers of Jesus. If you know and understand these things, if you're careful with your sorrow, your sorrow doesn't just give way to joy. It's going to produce joy to you, within you, and to others around you. You will achieve it. Look back at the scripture from the psalm. It says, we're going to go to verse 5. Those who sow in tears shall reap the shouts of joy. These tears are watering something. These tears are producing something. These tears are not just giving way to joy. These tears are producing joy. When I think about repentance, when I think about when I go to the Lord and I repent, gospel joy means you'll be repenting more often, in fact. And there's going to be some tears when you repent. But if you have enough joy, you're going to be repenting all the time. Now when you get into an argument or into a fight with someone, you're going to say, you know, what's wrong with me? Is this my self-centeredness? Is this my selfishness? Are these my flaws? What am I doing here? And when you can see it like that, every time you repent, you get free again. Freedom. And it produces this joy that's unexplainable. Unexplainable joy. Now my final thought for today is from verse 4 in the scripture. And I know... You probably glossed over it when I read it, when you read it. You probably just glossed over verse 4. This is how it goes when you read scriptures a lot. When you see a family lineage of a bunch of names that you can't pronounce, we like to kind of skip over some of that stuff. When you see a place from a different country that you kind of don't know where it's at, you don't really understand it, you kind of gloss over some of that stuff. We cannot gloss over this line today. We cannot gloss over this path today. So check this out. 126.4 says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Do you know the streams in the Negev, guys? Do you know what the context of this is? So the Negev is this terrible desert, dry desert, all sorts of dry riverbeds, barren, fruitless. Let me explain it like this. We live in Southern California. Have you ever driven on the 15 North going towards Las Vegas? Anybody here ever driven that drive, the 15 North going towards Las Vegas? Well, then you know that you're not going to see a whole lot of anything for a whole lot of time. Not going to see anything except for this vast, barren desert. In fact, there's a place that we even call Death Valley right next to it, situated very close we pass by the southern entrance of Death Valley at this beautiful place called Baker, California. <laughs> beautiful place. If you are new to Southern California, if you are watching online somewhere in the nation or around the world, I'm being facetious. Baker, California, man, it is hot, it is dry, it is barren, it is fruitless. The only thing it's known for is this big thermometer to show us how hot it is as we drive right past it, or maybe fill up with gas. Saying to have streams in the Negev would be like asking for streams in Baker, California. That's not how we think about Baker when we're driving on the 15 North. 
However, in the wetter months, get this, just north of Baker, very close, there's this river called the Moavi River. It's considered a river that rises when it rains and drops when there's no rain. However, when it rains, there is a power that comes forth in this area, in this river. Overnight, greenery and flowers can spring up. Overnight, this happens. Think about Baker. Overnight, the river can be completely dry, all dirt and dust. And then overnight, around 10 to 20 feet deep of water at certain parts where it's flowing. Now that I've given you some context, you know where I'm at here. The Negev in southern Judah, same. If it's dry riverbeds were to run as streams, that turn the land green and lush. There's greenery and flowers that spring up overnight. So what this psalmist is telling us that we know you, Lord, can bring about life and fruit and greenery overnight. Even to the driest of areas, we know you can bring up lush, green life in your miraculous ways. We ask you for our problems to go away. We ask for our difficulties to go away. What a great verse. Believing in the power of God, believing in the miraculous things that God can do, spring forth life and greenery and flowers overnight. And yet, this is where we get to the important question I asked you this morning. How do we handle times of sorrow? How do we handle times of tears and weeping? How do we handle times of pain and and, an immense grief? How do we handle it? Verse 5 and 6 say it. It says, when you put your faith in God, he's a miraculous God. We are still going to believe even if the rivers are dry. We are still going to believe in your deliverance because we've seen it before. We are still going to believe in your miracles because we know them in our life. And if you keep us in times of weeping, we know there will be joy. We don't know if the joy will come fast like overnight or if this will come on slowly, but joy will come. Joy will come in the morning. So I will sow my tears to reap shouts of joy to you, Lord. Don't waste your sorrows. And I know there's some of you sitting in here right now going, my life has been rough. My life is difficult. I just can't. I can't keep going. God, God's word is telling you, you will rejoice. There will be sheaves. It may be fast. It may be slow. Don't waste your sorrows. Don't waste them. Your Negev River will overflow. Your Moavi River will overflow. You will be fruitful. If you sow your tears, you will reap this joy. It will happen. Joy will be the final note in your life. Joy will be the final word in your life. Now, right now, before I get to pray over this message, and I pray the Holy Spirit has convicted your hearts today, I do want to pray over the blessing from this group in Terramore. Bringing all this food, I, like my wife brought up, go out and see that U-Haul truck filled with food that we are going to give families and kids who are homeless and, and not well off. What a blessing this is. I'm so proud of that group that I can't wait for the rest of our church to see it, to see what we can do together. Just a group comes together and see how we can bless our communities. This is our third week now in All In. And this is what I am praying for as your pastor. It's time to go all in. It's time to step in the faith and see what God does. Because God is going to do some miraculous things through us, through this church. 
I have been pushing into you this whole time how big our God is. Do not let guilt stop you. Do not let fear of things in this world stop you. Do not let sorrow, grief, and tears stop you. It is time to step into faith. It is time to walk out now and see what God does in your life because he's going to bless it. I know it's difficult to step out in that way, but he is going to bless it in a way that we can't even describe. And I am not preaching prosperity gospel right now. I am preaching a good God. I am preaching a God that we know that if we weep at night, joy is coming in the morning. Joy has the final note. So I am pushing into you, church. Time to step in. Let's do this together. I need you. The church needs you. Let's come together as this family of fellowship, of thanksgiving, and we're going to push forward and we're going to bless this community. We're going to bless the schools around us. We're going to bless the city of Corona. We're going to bless Riverside County. We're going to bless California. We're going to bless America. We're going to bless this world. Start thinking big. Start thinking big. Can we send people out on mission trips? Why not? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Can we meet up with other churches and and try to bless our community? Yes, we can. Start thinking big because our God is big. Don't think small. Get outside your box. Get outside your, I'm I'm stuck in this position. I'm just going to keep praying on it. Keep praying on it, but let's move forward now. Let's be all in for Jesus at this point. Will you stand with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to pray right now for for sorrow, for anyone in grief, for anyone in sadness, for anyone in despair that are afraid to go all in because they have been hurt in the past. Lord, show them that their tears and joy go together. Let them not waste their sorrows. I know there's people in this church with incredible grief, incredible sorrow. Lord, I pray that they not waste it. Let them sow for that day when they can reap with shouts of joy. Let us rejoice today, right now, I pray there is a rejoicing in each one of our hearts. Let the Moavi River just overflow in us right now. Fast or slow, we will rejoice. Joy will be our final note. Joy will be your final word in our life. 